Hello and welcome to the eighth lecture of type systems. In this lecture, we're going to talk about how we can use monads to control effects. So in the last lecture, in the previous lecture, what we found was that it was possible to write programs which go into infinite loops just as soon as you add state to the simply typed lambda calculus. So what we've got here is, on this slide, is this function called Landon's Knot. And what Landon's Knot does is it implements backpatching. Um, it implements recursion by backpatching. So what we do, if we want to take the fixed point of a function, is we create on line 3 a reference to some dummy function. And then on line four, we define this function recur. And all recur does is it forwards its argument to the reference R. And then what we do is we assign R and we say, let's set R to something that calls F, the function we want to find the fixed point of, with recur as its argument, and then whatever argument we want as the final argument to this. So you can see right here, that f takes two arguments, recur and n. And so recur is, so f is this uh, thing of type intero int to intero int, and recur will have the type intero int. Um, and so the whole thing, f of recur, will have the type intero int, and we give that an n. So this whole thing, um, this whole thing, fun n arrow f applied to recur, will have the type. Uh, int arrow int. And so what it's going to do when we call recur is what recur is going to do, if you give it an argument x, is it will dereference this pointer, find this expression and give it an argument. And so if you call it with x, we'll end up calling f recur x. And then whenever we reach recur, we will unfold that recursive definition one more time. And so now f will call itself recursively because we're going to have a, a, a pointer that forwards the recursive call right back to itself. And so what this will let you do is it will let you write functions that go into infinite loops. So here's a, so just to see it again, let's bring up our, uh, our code buffer and you'll get to see it. So code, let's do landin.ml and we'll say let's define the not function, which takes the f, which is the fi thing we want to take the fixed point of. So let's write that. And what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, I'm going to create a dummy. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to set r to Oh, let's set our uh, a recur function. And what this is going to do is it's going to forward to R. And now what we're going to do is we are going to set R to a function which calls F with recur and N. And now and this is just the same as uh, this bit of code on the slide. And now we'll just return recur. And so what we're going to see is that if we call not a fun fx goes to uh, fx looper. Now if we call looper with zero, it's just going to spin forever. So we've successfully implemented an infinite loop. And why is this important? And so th what's important about being able to write arbitrary loops is that now termination fails. So every well-type program equal closed well-type program E of type X, no, it won't terminate. In fact, right here, we just wrote one that doesn't terminate. Looper zero ran forever. And so because Landon's not let us implement arbitrary recursive definitions, we were able to write arbitrary, we were able to write looping programs. And as a result of this, every type is inhabited. And in other words, the consistency of the 
type theory as a logic is no longer true. So we managed to break the Curry Howard correspondence. We have a well typed, uh, we have a type safe programming language, but it doesn't correspond to anything in terms of language, in terms of logic. And so we started with the typed lambda calculus, sums, products, implication, you know, we had perfect propositional logic there. And then we added state as a primitive to this. We added the reference type and we added the uh, ability to load and store to references. And that seems like a very innocuous uh, addition, but it cost us consistency. And the problem that we had was that we had an unforeseen interaction between two different parts of the language. So in order to define recursive definitions, we just had to combine state and fu higher order functions. And now we were able to write arbitrary looping programs. So you can ask yourself, is this really a program? Um, I mean, maybe we do want Turing complete program. We do, we do want Turing complete programming languages after all, but it's, it's uh, always useful to be able to control the scope of your effects. So if you know that your, your, uh, what your program can do, then clients have, uh, have, uh, more understand have more understanding of what can happen so it's easier to reason about programs whose effects are very constrained so if you call a piece of code that you know won't have side effects then you know that it's not going to break any of your own invariants and we we lost one such invariant consistency in a very dramatic fashion and so if we did decide, if we do decide we want to retain consistency, we have to do something to control the use of state. And there's like a couple of things you can do. Um, one idea is simply to restrict the use of state. So the first thing you might think is, well, maybe we can limit what can be stored in a reference. So maybe if we limit ourselves so that uh, references can only point to pure data like booleans and integers, then we won't be able to introduce unbounded loops because Landon's not requ required higher order functions. So we, we don't let you create pointers to the problematic thing. And this actually works. So one of the very first programming languages that was ever invented, Algol 60, um, it had this restriction. And so the idea there was that you had mutable data in Algol, but it was always only ever data, like like uh, integers and booleans and strings and things like that. It was never pointers to functions. And so as a result of this, um, Algol had the interesting property that uh, it could be implemented completely with just a pure stack discipline. and in 1960, when your uh, when your program's memory was measured in thousands of bytes, when your computer's memory was measured in thousands of bytes, being able to have these kinds of constraints was like uh, was very powerful, was very important. Another approach is to keep arbitrary references but control how they can be used. Um, so if you look at the definition of Landon's knot, what you'll see is that um, we use this reference R in the definition of recur, and then when we do this assignment, we're saying R gets set to something that that includes uh, that includes a reference to R, and so this pointer is being accessed in uh, in uh, sort of an uncontrolled way. And one idea to limit is to limit how and where you can refer to uh, to references. And the general, uh, the general idea is called uh, linear or substructural type checking. And one particularly prominent use of this is in the programming language Rust. So in Rust, they restrict the use of pointers so that everything is either, you either have a single mutable pointer or many uh, immutable references to a, uh, to a pointer. You never have multiple um, pointers to a mutable data structure. Uh, and restrictions like this can also be used to regain consistency. And 
this kind of linear substructural type theory is extremely important in type theory, but unfortunately we won't have time to discuss it in this course. So instead, what we're going to look at is a different idea. What we're going to do is we're going to mark the use of state so that we always know when we're in pure or impure code. So we can define pure code to be programs which don't use state and impure ones which are the programs which do, do use state. And so by if you know something is pure then you know it won't use state and so you know that no one could have implemented backpatching in the pure fragment and so now you can say well what we can do is you can still write these looping programs but you just have to mark them in the type system and so and if you have an impure computation you can use a pure one but a pure computation can't use an impure one and so this way we can sort of do a kind of taint tracking, which says, well, if you use an impure computation the, in your computation, then your whole computation becomes impure because you don't know that a piece of unknown impure code when it's executed, you don't know what kind of effects it can have. And so what we can, so this idea of taint tracking has a much more glamorous name in, uh, in Haskell and other languages like this, you'll sometimes hear people talk about monads. And what monads are, are fundamentally a type constructor for, for describing an effectful computation. And so here, what I've got here is a simple extension to the simply typed lambda calculus. So we've got units and numbers and functions, and we're going to add the reference type, just like we had before. Ref x are the type of pointers to values of type x, and we're going to add a new type, t of x. And what this represents is a value of type t of x is an impure computation which yields an x. So it's a, a program which can do arbitrary state manipulation and if it will eventually produce a value of type x. Um, and so now you know just by looking at the type whether a expression can have an effect or not. So you can say, well, it's going to be, if it's a t of x, then it can have an effect. And if it's not, then you know that that expression won't, won't have an effect. And so most of this programming language is the same as before. We've got units, numeric literals, lambda abstractions and applications. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have our locations, just like we did in the last lecture. And we're also going to add a suspended impure computation as a, as a pure term. So if you have a piece of code that you don't run, it can be, it's perfectly fine to treat it as a value. So this is a suspended computation that when you execute it will have a, will have an effect. But as long as you don't execute it, it's perfectly fine to treat it as a value. And then what it contains is an impure computation. And what can an impure computation do? Well, impure computations can allocate new pointers. They can dereference a pointer. You can set one pointer with a new value. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, you can also do sequential uh, composition. You can evaluate E, find the result to X, and then execute the remainder T. Or you can say, I'm going to treat a pure computation as an impure one. So return E says a pure expression E is going to sort of get promoted to an impure computation that just accidentally happens to have no effects. And so our values, as I said, are the usual things. And we've got pointers and we've also got suspended computations. So we treat bracket T as a suspended computation. And because it's not going to execute, we treat it like a value. And so just like in the last lecture, stores are just maps from locations to values. And because we have both stores and free variables, we have contexts, which say what type each free variable has. And we have a store typing, which says what type of value is contained within each location in the heap. And so most of this type system will look very familiar to what we saw in the last lecture. So our typing for pure terms says that in, with store typing big sigma and variable context gamma, the expression E has the type X. And just like in the last lecture, most of these rules are very similar to the simply typed lambda calculus rules. And all they do is they thread sigma through all the judgments. 
So in the hypothesis rule, we check that little x has the type big X in the context gamma, and we have a big sigma that's along for the ride. When we check that a, a unit expression has the unit type, again, we have an arbitrary store typing and a variable context, similarly for natural numbers and for a lambda abstractions. And for applications, we check both the function and its argument in the store typing sigma and the variable typing gamma. And the only place we really need to use the store typing is when we have a, ver a literal point, a pointer literal. And now we can say if the location L has a value of type X in the store typing, then the pointer value L should have the type reference X. So the idea here, and remember, this is the typing judgment for the pure terms. So all we're saying is that a pointer value is a value. And as long as you don't dereference it, you're not going to have any effects. We, we can pass it around and it's perfectly safe to treat a pointer value as an ordinary pure value. And similarly, we can introduce monadic computations. And so what we can do here is we can say, well, this bracket T has the monadic type T of X if T is a computation that computes a value X. And so what we've just done in orange is introduce a new judgment which says that this term T is a computation which yields an X. And so note that we've divided our syntax into two grammars, E for pure expressions and T for imperative computations. And because we've done this division into two grammars, we have two typing judgments as well. And so pure terms are on this slide, and now on this next slide, we have the typing for the effectful terms. And so what we can do is we can say that we write, we write our typing judgment with this division symbol to say that T produces a value of type X, and it may have some side effects along the way. So we can write new E and that's going to be a computation which allocates a new pointer of type ref x. And this, this expression will have an effect, which is why it's in the effect typing judgment. And what we do is we say, well, we need a value to store at that location. And since we want an expression of type x, we can just say, give me an expression of type x. And once you've got an exp a pure expression of type reference x, we can dereference it with bang E, and now we get an impure computation which produces the X. And the way it'll give us this X is by loading the value from the pointer E, which has the type ref X. And similarly, we can do assignments. So if you have something E, which is a reference of type X, and you have an E prime, which is an X, you can store E prime into E, and that will have a side effect. And all that'll happen is that will be returned to unit. And so an assignment statement is something that's being done purely for side effect. We want to modify the global state and there's no interesting value to return from doing a modification. And if you've got, uh, we've got to finally, it's after these three basic operations which perform the state manipulation, we can also do things to do things like sequence them. So we have, if E has the type X, then return of E is a computation of type X. And so we're saying we can treat any pure X as a computation which yields an X. And so this, this means that the computation typing judgment is going to be conservative. So E is perfectly pure, and when we write return of E, it's still not going to perform any compu computations. We've just decided to track it as if it's an effectful program. And now, we can also sequence our effects. So if E has the type T of X, we can run E to completion for all, and after we run this effectful computation, if it terminates, we'll have a value of type X. And so we can bind it to this variable little x and then continue computing with T to eventually yield a Z. And so this is the sequential composition operator of computations and this lets us write programs which do sequences of pointer manipulations. And so now we've got 
two typing judgments, one for pure terms and one for effectful terms, how do they compute? And because we've got two, two grammars, we're going to follow the same procedure as with typing. We're going to introduce two operational semantics. And now something really interesting is going to happen. So if you look we're in the pure operational semantics, it's going to look very, very similar to the basic operational semantics of the pure simply type lambda calculus. We're going to have the congruence rules and the reduction rules. And so for functions, we'll say that if you see e naught e1 and e naught steps to e naught prime, then e naught e1 will step to e naught prime e1. And if the function position is a value, then v naught e1 will step to v naught e1 prime when e1 steps to e1 prime. And finally, for the, so those two were the congruence rules, which said that everything has to be evaluated left to right. And when you have evaluated everything left to right, when you have a function value and an argument value, you can take a step by doing a substitution. And so you can see something that uh, very interesting has happened. Because pure computations never have effects, we don't need to thread the store through each transition. So we know ahead of time that a pure computation won't touch or look at the store, and so we're able to leave it out of the operational semantics. And this means that the pure part of the language has the same operational semantics that the pure programming, that the pure simply typed lambda calculus did. And this makes it very easy to see that a pure program was never going to have a, a heap effect because there aren't any heaps to have effects on in the operational semantics. So the place where heaps show up is in the impure part of the language. And so this language is going to have a set of congruence and reduction rules just as before. And so if you see the expression nu e, as long as the uh, expression e can take a step, from e to e prime, then new e will step to new e prime. And it's only when the uh, value you want to store into a fresh pointer has been computed, and you have an expression new v, that you actually have, a, that you actually take a transition. So what we do here is we say, okay, new has gotten a value argument, so what we're going to do is we're going to find a location L, which is not in the existing domain. So we're going to find a fresh or brand new location L and in, in the store, and we're going to stick the value V there. And now we'll return the location L that we have just allocated. And similarly, for dereferencing, we're going to say, if you see the deref E expression, then as long as E can step to E prime, then deref e was going to step to deref e prime. And it's only when you're trying to dereference a literal location that you actually look at the store. So if you see bang L, now you know where to look in sigma. And so if L colon V is in sigma, this bang L is going to step to return V. And so we look in the store to find out what value to look up, and then that's the value that we return. And for assignment, it's going to look a lot like application. So E0 gets assigned to E1 prime, and we want to evaluate this left to right. So what we'll do is we'll say as long as E0 steps to E0 prime, then E0 assigned to E1 will step to E0 prime assigned to E1. And we'll have a second congruence rule for evaluating E1. And so these two rules together say, when you see E0 assigned to E0, E1, evaluate the two things in a left to right order. And again, it's only when you have a location value and a new value to v prime to store that the actual heap modification occurs. So if your store contains a location L that has a value v, then after you did this assignment, L assigned to v prime, then the store is going to change. It'll no longer have a v, instead L will map to a v prime. And now that we've had this side effect, what's going to happen is we can return unit because there's no sensible value to return from an assignment. Great, so those are all the operations that actually can touch or modify the store. And so we also need a few, a few things for the other operations, like the return and the bind. 
So uh, the, the let binding. So as long as E steps to E prime, then return of E steps to return of E prime. So this is a congruence rule. And for let binding, so as long as we see let X is equal to E semicolon T, as long as E is, can step to E prime, then this whole let expression, let X equals E semicolon T, will step to let X equals E prime semicolon T. So E step to E prime, and then this E inside of the let expression will step to E prime also. And if we ever see let x is equal to return v semicolon t1, well, now we have a trivial computation that, that's returning a value to bind to x, and we will just take the opportunity to do so. We'll say, okay, fine. If you're going to make it this easy for us, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute v for x in t1. The trickier case happens when let, we see let x is equal to t0 uh, bracket, semicolon t1. And so now what we want to do is we want to evaluate the computation t naught until eventually it gives us a value. And so what we'll do is we'll say, okay, well, if sigma t naught steps to sigma prime t naught prime, then sigma with let x equals t naught semicolon t1, it will step to sigma prime with let x equal to t naught prime semicolon t1. So right now we're evaluating this computation until we reach a value form, a return v, that we can bind to x and carry on evaluating t1. So we can't evaluate t1 until t0 is evaluated into a return v. And until then, we just wait we just wait until we get that value until we get that value that we need. Okay, so now we've given uh, ex pure expression and impure computation typing, and we've also given their uh, operational semantics here. And so in order to prove type safety, these two things are not quite enough. So the additional thing that we need is a store and configuration typing. So this should look very familiar from the previous lecture. So what we do is we say that under sigma, the store sigma, sig, little sigma prime has the type big sigma prime, and we'll have a rule that says little sigma and e have the have the typing big sigma and big x. And so, when you when we have our list of locations and their values, we just check in big sigma that sigma prime is well typed at big sigma prime and v is well typed at x and then that lets us cons it on to sigma prime. So now we have sigma prime comma l colon v and that has the type big sigma prime l with type x. And so this will let us give a type to every location in the heap that that every sorry that every value in the store has the type that its store typing says it should have. And a configuration will be well formed if we have sigma and a computation expression t and we'll check that sigma is a well formed store with all of its locations and that t is a computation that can refer to the locations in big sigma and it event will eventually yield an x. And so now this sigma semicolon t is a machine configuration that's ready for evaluation. And how do we actually evaluate one of these machines? Um, well, it's going to be it's going to be using these configuration update rules. Okay, so how do we show that it's well typed or type safe? And so it's going to be the same game of we need a substitution theorem, and so we're going to say that you can substitute a term into a, a pure expression into another pure expression. And so if you have E of type X and you have an expression E prime with a free variable little x of type X, you can substitute E for X into E prime and your type will remain the same. And in order to prove this, just like always, we're going to have to prove weakening and then exchange. Okay, so does anything change for the impure terms? And the answer is yes. What changes is that E's become T's and colons become division signs. And that is the entire change. So now what we're doing here is we're saying if E is an, a pure expression of type X and 
t is a computation yielding a z with a free variable little x of type big X, you're able to substitute e for x into t, and you still have a computation yielding a z. So these proofs will be not very complicated. So we do things in the usual way. We're going to prove pure term weakening and impure term weakening mutually inductively. So it's going to be weakening, exchange, and substitution, just like before. But the only thing that's going to be different in this case is that pure term weakening and impure term weakening will have to be proved at the same time. And this is because pure terms have impure terms inside of them as suspended computations, and impure terms have pure terms inside of them because of the return construction. And so you have to prove weakening for both pure, uh, pure expressions and impure terms simultaneously, and similarly for exchange and similarly for substitution. So because we have two mutually recursive judgments, one for term for expression typing and one for computation typing, we get two mutually inductive proofs. Okay, so now in order to get to the type safety proof, just like in the previous lecture, we have to introduce a store extension and store monotonicity lemma. So we can say that sigma is, a, uh, is smaller than sigma prime if uh, there is some extra set of locations and types that you can add to sigma to get sigma prime. And so once you have this, you can prove a simple store monotonicity lemma, which says if sigma is a smaller store than sigma prime and something is well typed in sigma, then it's going to continue being well typed in sigma prime. And so to prove this, you just do structural induction on the appropriate definition. And so everything will just work out because sigma is propagated through all of these judgments until you reach the leaves. And so it's, a, it's an easy induction to prove these, uh, these three properties. And so the reason we need this is, just like in the last lecture, to show that allocating a new reference will never break the typeability of a term. So new E adds something to the store and that means that we need to extend the store typing and for all the other things which already have a store typing we need to say that adding new locations doesn't break your old store typings. And then once you finally have it we can state and prove type safety for the monadic language. So just like always for type safety there's a progress theorem and a preservation theorem. And the progress uh, theorem says that if a uh, configuration is well typed, then either the term t is a, is a value or returning a value, or it's something which can take a step. And type preservation says, well, if you have something well typed that takes a step, then it's going to remain well typed. And you can see right here, as we say, there exists some sigma prime bigger than sigma, such that the new sig little sigma prime and the new t prime is well typed in this extended context. And so this is really why monotonicity is so important. So when sigma t takes a step to sigma prime t prime, uh, t may involve allocating a new reference. And so sigma prime can grow. And so the proof goes the usual way. For progress, you do induction on the well-formedness derivation of little t having the computation type x. And for preservation, you do induction on the derivation of the reduction relation. And so these proofs are relatively routine, and you're able to do them without, uh, without much fuss. Okay, so we have a type-safe monadic language. And so we can take a step back and say, what have we accomplished? And the answer is that in the monadic language, pure and effectful code is strictly separated. And as a result, we know that pure programs terminate. But we are still free to write imperative programs. They'll just have a different type. They have a monadic type rather than a pure type. Okay, and so the idea, so the interesting thing is that monads are not just for state. So any kind of effect can be given a monadic type. And so here's an example of using monads for IO. 
So we have units and numbers and functions, just like before, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, instead of having, having a T for state, we're going to have a T sub IO for IO, uh, for IO computations. And the pure fragment of the language is going to have units and numbers and lambdas and applications, and it's also going to have the suspended monadic computations, and our impure terms change slightly. Instead of new and dereference and store, all we have is a print statement. And in addition to printing, we're going to re retain the ability to do sequential computation and to treat a pure computation, a pure expression, as a computation that just accidentally has no effect with the return statement. Okay, and so what about values? In this in this language for I/O, the only uh, the only new value form relative to the simply typed lambda calculus is just going to be suspended monadic computations. Um, there's no references, no reference type, so we don't need reference values. Okay, so now what's going to happen? Well, the typing for pure terms is going to be exactly the same as it was for the pure simply typed lambda calculus. We just have a single context gamma, and all of the typing rules look just like the simply typed lambda calculus rules. And in particular, there's no store typing here. So there's just one context of variables, and there's no store typing. However, we still have the rule that says that bracket t is a suspended computation of type t of x, if we know that little t is a computation yielding a big X. And so we didn't have to change any of the typing rules for the pure part, they just got simpler. The only thing we have to really change is the typing rules for imperative computations. And how will those change? Well, what about printing? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if E is a pure expression of type nat, then print of E is going to print that natural number, and because it's running by side effect, it has no interesting re return value. It just returns a unit. Okay, and the T return and the T let rules are actually identical to before, and so what we've got is that E is an expression of type X, return of E is a computation of type X, and we've got T let, which is our sequential comp computation, composition. So if E has the type TX, we can run it to get that get out that X, and then bind it to the very vari little variable little X, which will let us compute big Z. And so the T ret and T let rules are identical to the monadic rules for state, and the only difference in this monadic typing is in the operations. So we've thrown away get set and new, and we've added print. And other than that, the monadic typing isn't going to change one iota. It's exactly the same as it was before. Um, we, all we changed are the typings that we added for the operations. And what we're going to see here is that the operational semantics of the pure part is identical to the rules for a state, for the, to the pure rules for monadic state. We have our left to right congruence rule, which says that e naught to e one, e naught e one is going to evaluate e naught first, and then once the function position becomes a value, we evaluate the argument position, and then once the function position and the argument position are both values, we do the substitution. So this is identical to the rules for monadic state, and it's identical to the pure rules of the simply typed lambda calculus. We didn't need to change anything at all. Um, the place where we need to change something is for the uh, operational semantics of the impure part. So when printing is your only effect, what you need to do is you need to thread through a, a list of all the tokens that you've printed out. So if you want to print E, you have to evaluate E until it becomes a value. And if you have a value N that you want to print, well, all you do, all we do in our model is we're going to say, well, if omega is all of the things that have been printed so far, then after you print n, you'll have printed n const on to omega. And just like with the uh, 
uh, language first state, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate return expressions until they become values, and when you have a let binding, you evaluate E until it becomes a, computa a suspended computation. And then, when it is a suspended computation, you say, is this return V? And if it is, you just do the substitution, V for X and T1, and otherwise, what you do is you're going to evaluate T naught until it becomes a return V. And as you evaluate the computation T naught, you may need to record more outputs that you've made. So the state is a set list of output tokens, and we thread this through the, st through the uh, operational semantics. And the neat thing about this monadic system is that the only thing that changes anywhere in this setup are the rules that govern the specific operations that you use for the monadic type. So for state, it's get, set, and new, and for IO, it's print, and so on for all the other effects you might want to use. Okay, and so this gives you a really powerful way of encapsulating effect. We've got this state tracking mechanism that says that if anything has a monadic type, then what you can do is uh, you can know for sure, well, you know that it may have an effect, and you can, and this keeps you from accidentally using it as part of a computation that was intended to be pure. Um, but what monadic style doesn't let you do is it doesn't let you encapsulate effects. And what does effect encapsulation mean? Well, a lot of state can be used in a local way where you use the state inside of the definition of a function, but it's not visible on the outside. So here is an example of the factorial function, which takes an integer and yields an integer. And the way this fun factorial f function is implemented is with a loop. So we create a reference r, which is initialized to 1, and then we match on the natural number n. And if it's 0, we return the contents of that pointer. And if it's n, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this accumulator r by n, and then we're going to decrement the counter and loop. And so this is just implementing a basic while loop as a tail recursive function, and it's going to calculate the factorial for you. And the 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 point is that no caller can distinguish this this factorial from the pure completely recursive one from the outside world's point of view they're absolutely identical and so you can ask should this function have a pure type or a monadic type the argument for giving it a monadic type is look it's actually doing something with state it needs to have a monadic type so that the taint tracking works and the argument for making it a pure type is that no caller can possibly tell that this function was implemented with state. It looks from the outside exactly as if it were a pure function. And yet the monadic type discipline isn't quite good enough in order to, uh, in order to give, it the, give it the pure typing. Okay. So what are some other things that you can do with that are limitations of monadic style? Well, another limitation of monadic style is the fact that you can have something which has an effect which, uh, which you can mask in another part of the program. So here I have this, uh, this uh, function find prime, which takes a predicate, a tick A to bool, and a list of A's, and it's going to return an A if the if it find as soon as it finds the first element of that list which satisfies the predicate. And so if Y is constant to Y's, then we test. Is P of Y true? If it is, then we can immediately return that head Y and otherwise recurse over the tail. But look up what happens in the empty case. So if you were trying to find an element of the list which satisfies the predicate and the list is empty, then all you can do is you can signal not found. And if down below, I have a function find, which takes a predicate and a list, and instead of returning an A and an exception, it returns an option type. And the way that we implement this is we use find prime. And we say, well, if find prime gives us an answer, we just wrap it in a sum, and if it returns us not found, we return none. 
And this is really tricky from an effective encapsulation point of view, because with a simple monadic type discipline, find prime should be effectful. And when find invokes find prime, that find prime can really have an effect, because you might have given it a list which doesn't satisfy the predicate at all. And so what we're doing is we're catching the exception in order to return the correct value. And the question is, should find have a monadic exception type in its type instead? Because it's calling a function find prime, which could have an effect. But it's trying to it's trying to call find prime and it's saying, well, if it's not found, I'm going to return none. And so this impure function find prime has somehow somehow been turned into a pure pure function find. And this is only possible as long as find prime doesn't have a monad in its type. Because you don't know what's been caught and what's not in OCaml. There are other languages which we'll in fact see on the next slide where you can do where you can do this kind of effect encapsulation. And the the point is that like the simple monadic discipline isn't good enough to handle these kinds of these kinds of features. So a third limitation of doing things monadically is maybe you want to combine effects. So maybe we want to uh, have a state monad which does some stateful computations, and maybe we have an I/O uh, an I/O monad which does some input and output. And suppose that we have a procedure P1, which does which does some stateful computation, giving you an integer that giving you a function which takes an integer and yields an answer, and we have P2 which is an I.O. effecting computation which produces an integer. And so now the question is that uh, how do we write a p program that does P2 and then after it gets that answer it passes it to the argument of P1? So how do we write programs which use multiple monads at the same time? And one idea that's about 20 years old at this point, or 25 years old at this point, was an idea called checked exceptions in Java. And so in Java, what they did was they wanted to implement a simple form of effect typing. And the idea there was that each method declaration in a class could state which exceptions a method was allowed to raise. And when you invoked a method with one of these, uh, with one of these exception declarations, the programmer had to write a, a handler for any exceptions that they haven't declared that they can raise in their own method. So if, you, if, if I have a method m1 that could raise the exceptions x, y, and z, and you're writing a method which says that your, your computation can only raise an x, then whenever you call one of my functions, you have to make sure that you handle y and z so it doesn't leak to the outside world. And that part of uh, checked exceptions in Java worked, but the other part, but it ended up not being used very much. And the reason was that the Java type system ar around checked ex exceptions was very inflexible. There was no polymorphism over exceptions, and it was hard to, uh, um, it was just too hard to use. And so in modern Java, you won't see many exception declarations at all. Okay, and so this whole business of what happens if you have many different possible effects, um, it come, it's a problem that people have studied for a long time, and these days there's a whole class of type system features, which I don't have time to get to in this class, called effect systems. And the idea is that if your types for function types can remember what effects they can have, then you can use the type inference system, the type checker of your language, to keep track of all the possible effects. And so there's a new language from Microsoft Research called COCA, which is an experimental language. It's not a production anything. It's, it's designed by researchers, and it's a JavaScript-like language, except that it uses effect tracking, and you can use it to track things like 
uh, whether functions are total or whether they raise exceptions, whether they do I.O., whether they, do, whether they can have state, and it even supports a form of user-defined effects called algebraic effects. And it's worth downloading and playing with because it gives you a good playground to see how a flexible effect system can make monadic effects usable in a pra practical language. And so you can go to the uh, Coca GitHub repository and download Coca and build it. It's actually, uh, it's actually surprisingly easy to do. So the, uh, the repository is coca-lang slash coca. And let's actually see a little bit of a, a little bit of coca code. And so here is a small bit of coca. And so what we've got here is a function main and it's going to do some prints. It's going to say print high world exclamation point. And below it, we've got a map function. So it's the classical thing from uh, from uh, 1a. In the nil case, you return nil. And if you have a cons with a head and a tail, what you are going to do is we're going to call f on the head x, and we're going to call map on the tail, and then we're going to cons the whole thing together. So maybe if I write it on multiple lines, it'll be a little bit easier to see what's happening. So this should look a little bit like OCaml here, or like JavaScript here, where you say, okay, I'm going to make y be f of x. I'm going to make yy be map f xx. And then I'm going to return cons y yy. Okay, great. Um, what type does this have? Let's take a look. Okay. Okay, and let's load. Uh, where is this directory? Test syntax. Test syntax braces one dot kk and okay, I'll pass the type checker. So let's get the type of main, and so the type of main says if you if you pass it. No, it's a function which, if you pass it no arguments, will will have a console effect. It can do I/O. So let's see what the type of print is. Oh, and print has is an overloaded function, and so in particular you can call it with a string down here. So print can take a string, and it will uh, it will have a console effect. So if we type. This is, is something which will have that, that console effect. And so if you run it, it will print hello. Okay. So that works and it has the effect that it's supposed to. And if you look at map, what map does is it says, um, it, it applies to a list, and so now let's take a look here. So we can do type of map, and map is also an overloaded definition, and the one up here says, okay, for all a, b, if you give me a function a to, what's this, e of b, it says, give me a function a to b, and it can have the effect e, and then give me a list of a's, and I will give you a list of b's, but it might have the effect e. Okay, so let's try this. Let's say val x's is equal to cons hello cons world cons, let's do that exclamation point, and now we'll do nil. And so we've got our list of strings here. X's is a list of strings. Hello world exclamation point. And now what will happen? Now let's see what the type of, uh, let's say, val foo is going to equal 
fun wise and let's call it uh, map print wise so what we're going to do is we're going to call this print function on let's say we want a list of strings okay give a Okay, so now I, I had to resolve the overloading ambiguity. So you can see here that this is a bit of a, uh, a research language where we have overloading, but it's a bit inconvenient to use. And so what we've done is we've said, well, foo is something which takes a list of strings and it has a console effect. Okay, so let's try. What if we call foo on that list x's? Okay. Okay, what did I do here? Check colon interactive effects don't match. Okay, so so now we what we've gotten is a kind of uh, with a effect mismatch error. So the the what we learned here is that the expression foo of x's has a console effect, and when we're binding things with a val. What, what, what it expects is to have no effects at all. So watch, if we do something with no effects, it's perfectly happy with this. But if we bind something that does have an effect, then it's, it's not going to be happy. Okay, and so now what happens if we do... Okay, let's do type foo x's, oops, type foo x's. And behold, we have our we have our computation console uh, that produces a list of units and it has a console effect. Okay. Now, um, you can see there are some rough edges, but it's actually surprisingly surprisingly uh, it's a surprisingly fun and productive experience to be told that okay, this whole thing um, this whole thing has a, it may or may not have effects. Okay, let me try one more thing wrap before wrapping up. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to use a pure function. So let's make a pure... Uh, we're going to make a pure function, increment. And it's going to take an x and it's going to return x plus 1. And so it takes an integer and returns an integer. And look right here, there's no effect annotation at all. And so if we do map incra hexes uh, oh it's a list of strings map incra one two three it will oh nil it's going to take one two three and give us two three four and there is no problem now. Uh, with binding it to a value, so there's no there's no if, if there's no effect mismatch at all. Okay, and so that's uh, that's pretty much it. I wanted to show you how, in theory, you can use monads to. Uh, uh, to track effects, and this is a thing that, like, increasingly many languages, uh, in increasingly many languages are starting to do. So Haskell, of course, is most famous for doing this, but there, but newer languages like Coca also support this kind of thing. Okay, thank you very much.